is very tangible. So what is race and where does it come from? Where does this idea uh, of race and differences between pe people based on their skin color and skin type and other racial characteristics really come from? And I apologize for my stock images. I don't have my own <laughs> set. So you get what, what PowerPoint has. Um, so to, to understand where race comes from, we actually have to take a step back. Race is not in itself a defined characteristic. It is a social construct. It is a system that was created actually to justify racial oppression. So racism didn't start because people understood there to be different categories of people and judged them differently. Racism came from systems of power um, really like in the 1500s, so in Portugal and Europe um, during the era of colonialism where there was slavery and there was mass enslavement um, really that started the Atlantic slave trade and the, the leaders in Portugal, and again, I'm not a historian, this is all from me reading other sources, uh, needed to justify that act. They needed to justify their treating other people as less than. And so they went out and they asked scientists and other scholars to say, can you please help us justify this? And they did that by creating types of people, by creating this classification system by race. And they created this idea of different races of people and created and really like delineated a hierarchy based on that with white people at the top. Um, and they described multiple races, including white, black, Asian, Native American, and they attributed certain characteristics to those groups and did that to justify their actions. Um, you know, so the idea of racial superiority or inferiority, really the idea of race at all was a way of justifying unequal treatment. So the unequal treatment came first. The idea of race came second. Um, Professor Ibram Kendi, and I'll reference him a lot, and I'll, I'll recommend that you read some of his writing. Um, he says that, you know, if we really believe, if we truly believe that all people are created equal, then any disparity in condition, any of those differences we see are the result of systemic discrimination. So the differences that we see between people as far as health or educational attainment, you know, in, in our country, we can come up with a list of examples and we'll talk about some of them. Um, they don't come because of inherent differences between people. They come from discrimination and systemic differences in how people are treated. Racism created race and racism is about power and maintaining power. Okay. So when I think about racism and we talk about racism, it's, it's not just an individual act or action. It's not just a thought. Now, certainly that's a piece of it, but really it, racism is a structure. It's a system. Um, it's a collection of policies. That's what racism is. It's, it's prejudice that is then backed up by legal authority uh, and propagated by the institutions in our world. So I, I wanna make sure we're taking that big view of racism. It's ideas, yes. It's policies, absolutely. That's where really the heart of this is. And then those policies create systems. So we're gonna talk through some examples here. So what's a racist idea? A racist idea, according to Professor Kendi, is any idea that suggests one racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. Okay, so that could be in ideas of intelligence, saying that one group is smarter or better in school or better in math um, than another group, right? Superior or inferior. Racist ideas really argue that the inferiority superior or superiority between race groups is explained it, that that's what explains inequities that differences between people are and groups by race are explained by differences 
in those people themselves rather than the policies that affect them. Okay, so saying that one group based on race is better at sports inherently than another, or more beautiful, or has a greater depth of culture, that's a racist thought. That's a racist idea, okay? Because when it comes down to it, this concept of race is a construct. It's not real in any meaningful way aside from that we've made it real. So I don't want to um, discount the experience of racism or that people's racial identity because in our society, the experience of race is real. But there is no inherent difference between people based on their race. And so any, any thought that one group is superior or inferior in any way is a racist thought or a racist idea. Now, does that mean that when you have a racist idea, you're a bad person? No, it doesn't. It means you've had an idea that was a racist idea. We are showered in racist ideas and racist concepts every day, all the time. Um, and these racist ideas are unavoidable unless you recognize them and try to address them yourself. So that's a racist idea. Racist policies. This is, I think, where we really should, you know, spend some time and really think about our, our own lives too. So a racist policy is any measure or policy that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. So not just something that is overtly creating a disparity, but anything that then also maintains existing disparities is a racial policy. So there's some obvious ones. You look at slavery. Yes, obviously a racial policy. Uh, the Jim Crow rules in the South. Yes, obviously racial policies. People were, didn't have access to restaurants, schools, the public facilities. Um, redlining and housing covenants. We're gonna spend a lot of time, or not a lot of time, but we're gonna spend some time talking about housing policy. Um, specifically in Minnesota, and those are racist policies saying that people who are Black can't buy a house in a certain area. Obviously racist. Um, but what about voter ID laws? Is that a racist policy? Yeah, because it disproportionately affects people who are Black and other minorities. Um, what about mandatory minimums in the criminal justice system? Is that a racist policy? Yes, in the end it is because it disproportionately affects people who are black. And, and what that means is, you know, when you look at these policies, it's not about their intent, it's about their outcomes. So what is the outcome of um, having a, 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 you know, mandatory minimum where people who use powder cocaine, and this is a common example, and you may have heard it, but people who use powder cocaine have shorter, um, less intense uh, sentencing guidelines for that crime compared to someone who uses crack cocaine. The issue there is that powder cocaine tends to be a drug used by white people and crack cocaine tends to be a drug used by black people or historically in the 1980s and 90s when this was put into effect. And so it led to disproportionate incarceration of black people compared to white people and therefore it is a racist policy. Um, but then we also look at measures that sustain racial inequity. So anytime we create a policy through our city council at our institution is this policy sustaining racial inequity? Is it doing anything to combat that racial inequity? We need to think about that. And I think that's a really hard thing to do, but it's an important thing to do. So that leads us to racial systems or racist systems, sorry. So that's any system that creates or sustains racial inequity through racist policies. So I, I'm going to use a few examples. I touched on a couple of them already, but I think these are very clear, to me at least. Um, so the criminal justice system, um, Black people are disproportionately incarcerated compared to white people. We know this. Um, why is it? 
why does that happen? Is it because black people are more criminal? No, that's a racist idea. That is a racist idea that based on the color of someone's skin or racial community or identity, they're inherently more criminal or violent or prone to illegal activity. Racist idea. So the um, way to think about it instead is to say, okay, what policies have led to this happening? It's, um, you know, uh, well, sorry, I have word finding difficulties. I think it's a mom thing, but um, is it the rules on uh, sentencing, the sentencing guidelines, or is it, um, yeah, that's part of it. Is it the way policing happens in different communities? Yeah, that's part of it. Um, is it policies that have led to poverty in historically black communities? Yeah, that's part of it too. So it's those policies the racist policies that have led to this disparity, to, that have led to this difference in incarceration rates, not behavior, not individual behavior, okay? We know that poverty and increased unemployment in a community leads to increased crime in that community. So should we be policing more or should we be trying to revitalize a community, create jobs and um, opportunity for people, improve education, right? So then education. So um, graduation rates for black students are lower than for white students. Suspension rates are higher for black students than for white students. Why is that? Is it because black students are inherently not as motivated, not as smart? No, absolutely not. Um, is it because black students have poor behavior innately? No, absolutely not. Those are racist ideas. So, it's because of policies that have left schools in black communities under-resourced. It is because we have a school system that was centered and designed on white students and white families and their needs. So instead of looking at an issue as an individual problem to explain these large disparities that we see, we need to take a step back and look at the policies that created that disparity. Healthcare is where I, you know, certainly have the most knowledge and experience. And we know that in Minnesota, we have some of the greatest health disparities in the country. So um, infant, and mortality, infant and maternal mortality rates in Minnesota are two to three times higher for Black moms and babies than they are for white moms and babies. Okay, so why is that? Why? Are... Um, Black women and babies inherently less healthy to start with? Do they take care of themselves less? Do Black mothers care any less for their babies or themselves? No, of course not, right? Those are racist thoughts. Those are racist ideas. So what are the policies that have made this happen? And they're multiple, right? None of this is isolated based on one single policy. So um, Certainly there is individual level racism that leads to this, that we know that black women aren't listened to as much or believed as much when they access healthcare, but it's also policies that have led to decreased rates of health insurance um, and coverage and access for black people compared to white people. Uh, we know that about one in two women after giving birth in the postpartum period um, goes back to work within two weeks because they don't have any paid or guaranteed maternity leave. Two weeks. Any of you who have ever had a baby cannot imagine that, and I know you can't. So, um, you know, any policy that keeps that going or created that, that's, that explains this. Um, so an anti-racist policy, and, and we'll talk more about this. So how do we fix that, right? Well, universal health care insurance universal paid maternity leave. That's a way to guarantee that Black women have the same access to some of these privileges that, you know, more white people already have through our employers because of historical and continued racial differences in opportunity, right? So it's complicated. None of it is simple, but it's not about behavioral differences of the individuals in a racial group, right? It is about systemic differences in how people are treated and the opportunities they're given.
that's a lot. So I'm going to take a break here and see what questions or thoughts people have that you'd like to touch on from what I've said already. If anything. Hannah, I, I've got a thought. Can you hear me? Please. Yeah. yeah this, this is art. Um, I find everything that you say is true. Uh, but my, my concern is it's narrow. It's narrow in that you've described systems, which I totally agree with. Um, but in my view, it's all systems. And that if we back up, as you talked about uh, before, I think we need to back up to the whole foundation of the United States of America. And that the foundation of the United States of America is white supremacy. And the history of the laws and the systems and the creation of those systems is to advantage white people. And in particular, white male landowners that we call the founders, founding quote fathers. And, and so if we back it up that way, then our entire environment is a white supremacist environment that racism buttresses, that, that, that racism uh, reinforces and makes happen. And in my mind, that changes the idea or, or the conversation about racist ideas and racist policies, because they're not individual policies. And they're not individual, it's the way we think. It's the way policy is made. And, and if that's true, we've got to really, especially those of us that look like you and me, need to be really, really aware that we're operating in this system and the system is really elastic and really strong. And even with so-called good policies, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Housing Act 1965, 68, and so on and so on, they were, you know, said everybody, just like you were talking about universal health care. But here we are 50 years later, and they're not universal. Yeah. So no, I, I just think, think the perspective yeah. is really important. Sorry for that. Absolutely. Go on. No, no, absolutely. And I think I think that is such a good point. And that's exactly where I want to make sure everybody gets to is understanding that. You know, I think there's a couple great analogies. Uh, and in the resources I'm going to share with you, I'll I'll give you links to a, a podcast and also a a great um, TEDx video by by people I admire that do a better job of using allegory to explain what you've just explained than I'm able to. Um, just the way that our entire environment is founded on racist principles and racist policies. And so when we deny their existence or we deny the existence of race or ignore the existence of race, we are by our inaction allowing these race policies and principles to continue and to maintain their strength. Um, so I think that's a good segue into kind of the next section, which is anti-racism and what, how we can be thinking about things differently. So let me share my slides again. Okay. So um, anti-racism is, um, the idea that, um, you know, where I, where I want us to get is that to be not racist is not doing us any good because to be passive or to go with the status quo 
is to continue supporting and living in and benefiting from this system that is founded on racist principles and policies from the beginning. Like, like you said, the whole origin of our country was founded on these racist principles. So um, when we live in a society founded on racist principles and with long standing racist policies and institutions, um, it's not enough to just not be actively racist. Um, you know, I remember being taught as a kid and I, I see a couple people who are my contemporaries in this room, you know, that all people are equal, we shouldn't see color, we should treat everybody with kindness and love, um, the golden rule. But that's not what we should be teaching our children. And that's not what we should be internalizing for ourselves. Because by ignoring the effect of racism on our community, um, we're allowing it to continue. By not seeing race, we're ignoring the racist system that we are a part of, okay? And we're ignoring our role in that. So we can't be colorblind because the world and society and our policies and our government is not colorblind. Um, and to say that we are denies the experience of people who are affected by racism. And we're all affected by racism. Um, but, you know, experience of people who are directly affected, the people who are black and brown and experience in it day to day. Um, so instead of by striving to be not racist, we should strive to be anti-racist. We should strive to take apart the system and, and rectify these inherent problems that we see. And I'm just going to take a second because I, I want to acknowledge the fact that I'm talking about anti-black racism. Um, there certainly are lots of forms of uh, discrimination, uh, and we'll touch on that a little bit, but I want to just be clear, what we're talking about today is anti-Black racism. Okay. So what's an anti-racist idea? It's any idea that suggests that racial groups are equals in all their apparent differences. So um, my, what I wear when I'm comfortable going to the grocery store may be different than what you wear when you go to the grocery store. What makes you comfortable? Does it make my sense of fashion better or worse? Does it make yours better? I mean, you may have better fashion sense than I do, but it doesn't make, it, it's not a sign that one of us is better or that our way of living is better. Um, I may have different health outcomes. I may, in the white community, someone in my family, we may have uh, less hypertension, high blood pressure than in a black community. Um, those differences aren't better or worse. It's not something inherent in my biology that did that. It is the effect of um, kind of racist policies and other differences. My beauty standard may be different than someone else's beauty standard. It doesn't make me any more or less beautiful that my standard is a little bit different. The issue is that we live then in um, a world that doesn't actually support that, right? We have, uh, when I say all these things to you, you may say, well, that may be true, but like, it's hard to believe that that's true in the world where we live. Um, and that's the point, right? When I say I have this anti-racist idea that, um, you know, someone with natural black coily hair is just as professional appearing or someone with braids or however they want to wear their hair is just as professional appearing as me with messy hair and a hair in a ponytail. Um, yeah, that's true. And yet we have policies that say black women can't wear their natural hair to work. Um, we just this year in Minnesota, they passed a, poli a, a law saying that that was, wasn't okay anymore, right? So um, these anti-racist ideas kind of fly against the status quo, and that's the idea. So what are some anti-racist policies? And is any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups? So what's equity and how is it different than equality? So I like this image uh, because when we're starting from a place of a racist foundation, racist um, really, I mean, foundation is the best word I have, to achieve equity, different groups, different individuals need different types of support. We're not all starting from the same place. And it's not an accident that we're not starting from the same place. It was intentional and created by policy that different groups have um, different footing to start with. So 
I may not need any extra support right now, but some of my neighbors might, and some of them might not, might need even more to be able to get to be able to see this baseball field. So what are some examples of um, strong anti-racist policies? The Voting Rights Act, giving people access to the vote. Not perfect, but helped, made a big difference. Um, and that was just, you know, we just saw the, the implications of some of those voting protections being taken away in the recent elections. Um, if you saw the news about districts that were primarily black in some of the recent voting areas, the access to functioning, uh, timely ability to vote was taken away in a lot of black neighborhoods in black districts when it wasn't in white districts. That's a racist policy or a racist implication that came from getting rid of this anti-racist policy. Um, affirmative action. So giving uh, increased access to education and employment to, um, to Black students and employees who didn't have access before. That's an anti-racist policy. Uh, and as I alluded to before, you know, universal paid medical or family leave. Again, I have paid medical leave. I have paid family leave through my employment. Um, more white people are already have access to that than black people. So by making it universal, we are lifting up primarily the people who need the help the most. Okay, that's an anti-racist policy. Same thing with a policy like Medicare for all. There's a lot of examples. Um, and then you can see when we have these anti-racist policies, when we take them away, we see increased racial disparity. We see increased effects of racism once again. Uh, there's a statement that I like that some of you may know, but that when you're used to privilege, equity feels like oppression, right? So when you're used to always having access, having easy access because you're there, and now all of a sudden, everybody else has that same access. You have that more competition. It's equal, it's equitable, but it feels like oppression because you're used to having it alone. Um, and I think that's part of why, as a society, some people struggle with, with um, anti-racist policies and pushing them through uh, because they are um, taking away privilege. Um, and we don't like to acknowledge our privilege sometimes because it's hard to recognize that everything we have didn't come simply from our hard work and grit. Um, because we have worked hard. I know I have. Um, but I also had great privilege. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think we need to talk about that. So then anti-racist systems. So any system that increases racial equity through anti-racist policies. I don't have any good examples for you. I wish I did. Um, I can't in my life think of any systems I'm a part of that are consistently anti-racist. Now I can think of some systems I'm a part of that are doing the work, that are trying. I can think of some that are, are fighting against that work and trying to maintain the status quo. But I can't easily think of any systems in my life, in my community that consistently do this work and do it well. I wanted to take a minute and talk about intersectionality. And I think that's something that's really interesting, especially for those of us who are Jewish on this call. Um, because when it comes to the impact of oppression, um, the whole is often greater than the sum of its parts. So for someone who's a woman and experiences sexism in the workplace, uh, that's real, 100%, that's real. Um, for someone who is black and experiences racism in the workplace and the educational system, also real. But you know what's more real, or not more real, but being a black woman in the workplace or the educational system, that person encounters more than the sum of the parts of being both a woman and being black. Somebody who is a gender minority or a sexual minority, or uh, not wealthy, you know, all of these things, someone who doesn't speak the language that is the most commonly spoken language in their community, someone who's an immigrant who doesn't have perhaps the right papers or documentation, um, all of these things are sources of oppression. And it's the intersection of these 
um, identities that we need to focus on. Because, you know, when we think about being anti-racist, if the only people we're thinking about in our policies and our anti-racist policies are able-bodied people, we're excluding um, people who um, are in the Black community but need more support. And so we should be centering on the margins. We should be centering on the people who are um, at those intersections of oppression. Uh, and, and I think that's really important. This, this term comes from um, Kimberly Crenshaw. She's a, a legal scholar and a feminist. Um, and she really focused on the intersectionality within feminism and how traditional feminism really ex ignored the experience of Black women. Um, but, but it's grown since then, and I think we need to constantly take it into account. So, you know, the definition, and I don't usually use a, a dictionary definition, but I think this one's really helpful. Um, the complex cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism, sexism, classism, ableism, combine, overlap, or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or group. So when I think about that for myself, I think, well, I'm part of this community, a Jewish community where, you know, my, my ancestors, my family, even myself, I have experienced anti-Semitism. Yes, absolutely. That's real. Anti-Semitism is here and it's real and it has an effect. Um, but what if I was Black and Jewish? What if I was disabled and Jewish? What if I was Black, disabled, transgender and Jewish? What would that experience be like? And that's who we need to be centering on instead of centering on ourselves by focusing on policies that help the majority and have trickle down benefits for everybody else. Has trickle down anything ever worked, right? We need to be centering on the people who need the support the most and lifting them up with our work. Um, so I, that's the idea of intersectionality. And I just wanted to make sure I shared that with you. Oh, I've bumped. I had a couple slides by accident. So um, let's just take another break there for just a second um, before we move into white privilege, you know, for fun. So um, any thoughts or um, comments? Yeah, this is Sheldon. Um, first of all, it's a great presentation. But I want to challenge you on one of the statements you just made, which sure. is that you don't believe you belong to any institutions that are overtly racist, I think is how you said it. And I would, I would say the same thing about myself. They're not overtly racist, but as I've learned over time, really recently, I, I know I belong to institutions that are subtly racist. You know, I think of my congregation, I think about Jacob congregation and what I have learned from uh, people of color who belong there and what it's been like for them at times to walk into the institution on the high holidays when there are police out front and how they get watched all the way they come in and they get followed in until someone, in the, someone white in the congregation says, oh yeah, they belong. Uh, and what are we doing to try and change that? I think about um, the hospital that I work at, and I think about our board of directors, or I think of the medical directors within our hospital and the leadership, and how many people of color are there. Um, so I think that we all need to critically look at organizations we belong to, and even though they may not be explicitly racist, we need to look at ways that they may be um, uh, subtly racist, and we need to learn about that from the people of color who belong to those institutions to tell us, because me as a white guy with white privilege, I'm not going to pick up on it otherwise. Thanks. Thank you, Sheldon. And I, I just want to say I, I misspoke, if that's what you heard, because I, what I meant to say is that I, I'm not a part of any institutions that I recognize to be fully anti-racist. I am a part of many institutions that I know are racist or ha are founded on racist principles. Um, so thank, but thank you for that because I think that that is such a, a good example of um, centering on the needs of 
um, the black community, especially, you know, at synagogue or at our hospitals, I agree with you that, you know, how does, you know, the police officer may make some of us feel more safe, it may make others feel less safe. So how do we, how do we address that? Um, so thank you. Any other thoughts right now? Well, let's talk about white supremacy then, shall we? Um, so white privilege, um, this is a complex term. Um, it's not easy. Uh, it can mean a lot of different things, I think. I think of it in a couple of different ways. I think of it as first the privileges I've had because of my whiteness as an individual. I think a lot about individual white privilege. So because of like historical access that my parents and grandparents had because of their whiteness, what opportunities did it give me? Um, when I get pulled over for driving fast because I will, and dad and mom close your ears when you're watching this, I drive fast. Um, you know, what, what privileges do I have during that encounter with a police officer because of my whiteness? Um, if I, you know, go into a doctor's office as a patient, am I treated different? If I walk into a hospital as the physician, am I instantly thought to belong there because of my whiteness? So those are all examples of my individual white privilege. But it's more than that too. It's, it's this idea that whiteness is the norm, that whiteness is normal, and that people who are white, we often don't even think about our whiteness. I mean, just think, how, how often do you identify as white? When you think of yourself, do you think of yourself and your whiteness as a characteristic of who you are? You know, I know I, I generally don't, but we should and we need to because our whiteness is a characteristic of who we are in this racial and racist society, okay? And that's our white privilege is that we don't have to acknowledge our whiteness. Um, so um, we, because of our whiteness, can very easily ignore and not see the effect of racist policies because often they're invisible to us um, because they haven't affected us directly. Um, and that's our white privilege. So white supremacy, what's that? It's, it's the system that keeps us having our white privilege. It is, the system of policies that maintains whiteness as the norm. And so Professor Kendi says, whoever creates the norm creates the hierarchy. And that makes sense. The victor writes the history book. Um, so whoever creates the norm creates the hierarchy and positions their race class. So he's talking about the intersection of race and wealth and class. It positions their race class on top. So if the elite race, the elite race class they're judging the poor race classes by their own cultural standards, then those other race classes appear inferior because we're judging them based on our own standards. And if we're then that white race class is also then the same group making the rules, defining what's okay and what's normal and what's legal and what's criminal, then it perpetuates the system. Um, and so a system of power and control by a racial group that's in a position to protect its own power and control, that is a white supremacist system. So yes, white supremacy, it's the KKK, it's um, you know people marching with swastikas and Confederate flags in the streets, but it's also our system, okay? So it isn't always an overt in your face issue. It's any system that is meant to maintain that white supremacy superiority, that white privilege, that whiteness is the norm, and that isn't working to dismantle the racist systems around us. So white fragility, you may have heard this term. Um, there's a whole book about it, not my favorite book. Um, but this is the concept of why is it hard for white people to talk about race? Why is it hard for us to own the fact we are part of this racist society filled with racist policies? Um, why is it hard for us to recognize that we are complicit in maintaining this racist hierarchy within our culture, within our world? So part of it stems from 
how we're taught, how we are kind of ingrained. The idea of racist is taught to us. So it's, if you're racist, you're bad. If you're not racist, you're good. To be racist is to be a bad person. Um, and we need to stop thinking of it that way. Because if we instead recognize racism as derived from a complex set of policies, then we can recognize when we have benefited from a policy that was a racist policy and that that influence has made us think thoughts or have ideas that are racist ideas. That it's not about being good or bad. You can be a good person and have racist ideas. You can be a bad person and have anti-racist ideas. These two are not linked. Now, certainly, I would say people who are intentionally racist and doing crimes of racism and white supremacy, that, that's different, right? But to exist in our society and have benefited from racist policies and systems does not inherently make you a bad person. And I think that is a really important thing to understand um, because this is not a personal attack on any of us as a white person. Um, now, should we, now that we recognize our role in this, take steps to dismantle these systems? Yes, absolutely, right? Um, I, I feel that as a moral imperative, uh, but uh, to have been part of these systems historically is not our fault because we are all born into this world and this is the world we live in. And now it is our responsibility to take it apart and build a better world. But that's the idea of white fragility, okay? The idea that when confronted with our complicity in this system, a lot of white people get defensive and say, no, but I'm not, but not me, but not me, but, but really it's all of us. Um, so, so that's white fragility. I want to take a minute before we just open up to more conversation and just talk about the Twin Cities a little bit. So look at this map. Find your house. Um, where do you live? Who are your neighbors? Who goes to your school, right? If you're a parent, a grandparent, who goes to your kid's school, your grandkid's school? Um, who went to your school when you were growing up? Think about your neighborhood. So racial covenants. Um, in Minnesota really started in 1910. Um, and some of you may know a lot about these, some of you may not know much. I've learned about them in the past couple of years. Um, there's a project um, through a bunch of agencies, including the university in Minnesota called the Minnesota Mapping Prejudice Project, where they have been tracking down racial covenants in property deeds throughout the city of Minneapolis. They've been scanned in, so that's why they've done Minneapolis and not St. Paul. Um, and what they're looking at are um, language used in the property deeds in throughout the city that exclude black people from buying those properties. Um, written into um, the language of the deed as these neighborhoods were created or as houses were built, as um, property changed hands during those years. It was written into the deed that no black person could buy the property. It could never be handed down. A realtor could lose their would lose their realtor's license if they sold a property to someone who was black. Um, and that house could be just taken away because it was illegal for it to happen. So a black family trying to buy this house, even if a realtor would sell it to them, they could immediately lose lose the house, just legally have it taken away. Um, so this started in 1910 and continued. Um, for decades. Um, initially, these same uh, racial covenants included, uh, you know, selling to Asian people, to Jewish people, though the religious exclusions were outlawed in 1919. So nine years after this started, the, the religious exclusions were removed. But certainly this affected the Jewish community too. Uh, so this severely limited where people could buy homes if they weren't white in Minnesota. Now, redlining, um, I imagine many of you have heard that term. This is um, something that came from the National Housing Act of 1934. So this is 20, 25 years after the use of racial covenants started in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, so essentially, for, for 25 years, as 
subdivisions were being created in the suburbs at, and in what we now think of as Minneapolis and St. Paul, there were laws restricting who could buy the homes in those areas and only white people could buy the homes in a lot of these areas. In 1934, when the Federal Housing Administration was formed and they created uh, mortgage opportunities for people to get um, protection on buying a home, a lot of people were able to buy homes for the first time, but they created risk stratification for neighborhoods. And they said, okay, if you are in a green area, that is a safe zone. It was a desirable zone and it was easy to get a mortgage. Banks would lend to someone buying a house. And, and you can't see kind of south of Calhoun, but all of that along Minnehaha is green there too. Um, and a blue zone was still desirable. Yellow was declining and red was undesirable. And these maps um, essentially meant that no lender would fund a mortgage in those red zones. Now, if you look at this map, you can see that it is um, a straight shot um, up into North Minneapolis, through Cedar Riverside, through the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul, um, through areas of South Minneapolis in, in, in Minneapolis as well. So what, what did that do? It, this had a huge effect on um, racial inequity in Minnesota because people first were not in, in these areas were places where where the black community already lived, where black people had their homes, had their apartments, had their communities. And now all of a sudden, white people were able to buy homes in the suburbs, in their cities, in the areas that were um, where they already lived. Um, and black people couldn't invest in the homes in their own neighborhoods. Now, we know that home ownership is one of the best ways to build wealth. And um, Black people were denied that opportunity in their neighborhoods. And if they tried to leave their neighborhood, they couldn't because of the covenants. So they had no opportunity to live outside of these red zoned areas. Certainly, they couldn't buy a home outside. And then with zoning laws throughout Minneapolis and St. Paul, there's no opportunities for renting. Um, because until recently, you couldn't have multifamily units in many areas of Minneapolis as well. So, redlining, hugely important in understanding segregation and um, access to services and wealth in our communities. So, um, what, what effect does that have now? So, this is a, a look at life expectancy in the Twin Cities metro area in, um, I think this was 2014, is that what it says on there? Um, very recent, by zip code. Let's look at this map and compare it to what we were seeing in the last one. If you look up here, this was a red zoned, a red lined area. This is a red lined area. This is a red lined area, okay? These are the, the bright green areas where I live right here in Mendota Heights. Um, where my parents live in Highland and St. Paul, um, you know, around the lakes and these classically white areas where people have been able to invest in their homes because they had access to mortgages, they're doing fine. People are living on 30 years longer than in um, Midway, than in North Minneapolis. This isn't by accident. This didn't just happen. Um, this is also a map of environmental racism, right? So where did Highway 94 go? It went into a redlined area, okay, right? Where did Highway 35W get built? Through a redlined zone through South Minneapolis. That then increases pollution in those neighborhoods. It increases rates of asthma and other respiratory illness. Um, these are then the neighborhoods where factories with pollutants get built. So. So these racist policies have lasting, lasting implications on the disparities that we see. So when you see disparities like this, it's not an accident. It's not just because, oh, a different type of person lives in that neighborhood. Why do they live in that neighborhood? Why do the people who live in your neighborhood live there? Why are there, are there apartment buildings on your street? Why not? If there aren't, how would you feel if there was? These are important things that we need to be thinking about. So um, you can find great maps. And again, when I email you and Barbie emails out the list of resources, there'll be some great interactive maps to look at. Um, understanding our communities and why they're built the way they are, why they continue to be the way they are. Why does a school in this neighborhood have 
a lower graduation rate than a school in this neighborhood? And how can we fix that, right? How do we shift potentially some of the resources from here to there um, to make things equitable? So um, tough questions, don't have answers, but definitely want to raise the questions with you today. So in summary, we live in a society, in a country that was founded and sustained by racist policies. As white people, we benefit from these policies a lot of the time. It's possible to create anti-racist policies, but we have a lot of work to do. Um, this is a list of resources. If anybody wants to like take a screenshot, um, please do. Otherwise, I'm Barbie, I'll email you, um, you know, a copy of this with links that people can follow for the things like the podcast and some um, YouTube videos that I really recommend. And I'll, I'll highlight the ones that I think are the most helpful as a place to start. Um, as far as books, I really like So You Want to Talk About Race and How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, Dying of Whiteness is really interesting. And, and I also, of course, like Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Um, I know some people read uh, White Fragility. It's not my favorite book. I think it's okay and I think it has some good points, but I, I wouldn't have it be the only thing you read. You know, if you want to read it as a piece of what you do, that's great. Um, but make sure you're reading Black authors primarily. Uh, there's some great podcasts to listen to. So Brene Brown interviewing um, Professor Kendi, if you don't feel like you have time for the whole book. <laughs> um, it's a great intro into his thesis. Uh, there's a podcast called Code Switch. Um, and they do a great episode on redlining um, and its effects. Uh, the 1619 podcast, that's from the New York Times. You maybe read everything when it was in the magazine, which is great. Um, Dr. Kamara Jones is a fantastic physician and public health worker. And I, I, if you do one thing, I'd have you um, watch this YouTube video of her speaking about allegories on race and racism. I think um, many of our kids could also follow that and understand it. So I think that's a really good place to start. Um, and then movies, the other thing I'd want everybody to do is watch Jim Crow of the North on PBS. If you haven't, it is a, um, a local uh, look at racist housing um, policies in Minnesota and why, why we have the um, effects that we do. So again, I'm gonna make sure Barbie has this to email out to everybody. So if you email her, she'll make sure you get um, this full list of references and I'll have the links in there so it'll be easy for you. Um, I am gonna come back so that we can all see each other. Um, and have some conversation. Thoughts, comments, questions, disagree. Do you agree? Do you disagree? How do you feel? You ready to explain all this to your kids? <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, I think since our time is so limited, I, I can speak. I think I will take the liberty of speaking for myself. And uh, I know many people that I've seen in the chat that um, your presentation gave us such a good foundation to start with, that you uh, gave it to us in an open and uh, caring way that we could take it in, and that I personally feel encouraged now, uh, especially with such clear definitions to move forward in this. And <clears throat> i just like to underline that your idea excuse me, of doing a first session about looking at ourselves um, is imperative. And I thank you for that. Um, and I thank uh, Sheldon Berkowitz, Dr. Sheldon Berkowitz for suggesting that I contact you. I also was remiss of, say, of thanking the Tomatora St. Paul and Hineni for co-partnering this with us. We could not have done this without you. So I appreciate that. Um, and I really thank all of you for taking an hour out of your day for something that's incredibly important, but sometimes <clears throat> we make choices with our time. And I want all of you to know that, um, that I'm glad to be in a room of 45 plus people that chose to spend an hour of their day looking at this very important topic. Um, our next session is not next week and that's in, on purpose. It's on July 21st gives you a little time to keep taking that oxygen in so you can take the oxygen before we talk to our children in our lives. And we will be joined by Dr. Nate Chomillo, um, who this is an area he can really talk about. And 
he's really fun to look at. He has this great bow tie every time I see a picture of him. So I think, uh, I think that will be, uh, I think he will come with a lot of um, really tangible. This session was really to get us starting to think, um, as, as uh, Dr. Lixon said, and our next session will be with uh, someone who has expertise in really how do we start the conversation with our children. I'm sure many of you have already started and they're really smart. They're going to ask good questions and they know a lot. So uh, we need to learn with them and uh, be doing our own learning. So again, thank you to Dr. Lixon, to Dr. Berkowitz, to Heidi Tarshish who helped do this and thank you all for being here. The most important thing is since we did not have registration, my email is blevine at stpauljcc.org. If you forget that, you can look at the St. Paul JCC website. I'll say it one more time, B. Levine. It's also in the chat at stpauljcc.org. Please, even if you think I have your email, if you want the resources, please let me know. Dr. Lixon, the question was, is it possible to get your presentation uh, or not? Oh, my slides? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But, so we, I will also make sure that those slides get sent to you and the resources. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and a special thank you to my parents who are in the next room with my children. So I just have to <laughs> give a shout out. <laughs> thank God for grandparents who live yeah. close. <laughs> all right. Look forward to seeing you all in a couple weeks. Good. July 21st. Barb? Yes. Can we get the recording? Yes, I, I will figure out how to do that. So that, that will be on my homework list, okay? Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a great, great presentation. Thank you so much, doctor. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Tan, it's so good to see you. I know. Oh my gosh, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I'm wearing a, a, a blouse for the first time in months. I'm very... Instead of scrubs, you mean? Yeah, scrubs are just like tank tops and sweatshirts. Yeah, yeah I'm wearing a tank top right now. But yeah, sorry for Peppa in the background. Um, I am going to reach out to you. Aton and Tali Kravitz and uh, Jeff are organizing a TCJMS slash JSchool alum fundraiser specifically um, for the Black and Indigenous communities here post riots and everything and engaging each class and just conversations in general. So anyway. That's fantastic. Yeah, but I love what you're doing, and I'm sorry for Peppa. <laughs> Back don't up. apologize. Oh my gosh. What'd you say? I said don't apologize. Like when like I, the only reason the kids aren't on me because I was leading. Usually they're like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is so great, and also I've been thinking a lot lately about like um, just looking at uh, intergenerational trauma, like when people call CPS and things like that in medicine and just how that's received. So anyway, yeah, I'm absolutely. thinking so much about it. And I'd love to connect another time. Oh, please. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Find me on Facebook. I will. Okay. Right. Barbie, thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow is fabulous to have you. Fabulous. Yeah. Hannah, you. you really have a gift. I felt oh. like you, no, really, you have a gift of, really talking to people, they feel seen, they feel uh, like you're not making judgment and that you come to be with them and in, in a way that they could over time and a lot of hard work and bring their experience and, and add their knowledge to this to all work together. So it's, um, a, it's, a, hard, it's a hard topic. It's a um, really hard topic, and I thought your explanation about good and bad, I loved your explanation about fashion in a, <laughs> like a grocery store, just in sense of what we're used to. I mean, I grew yeah. up with very strong, you know, manners and what you dress and how you do that. And it was, 
and I think those type of things we don't even realize in ourselves. Exactly. Sometimes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I'll send you an email yeah. with like all the resources. Okay. Sure, I'll take care of it. I'll see you in a couple. All right. Of weeks. Thank you, Barb. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Bye bye.